in an unknown location at the edge of town. Ugh. I'm pretty sure it's me making a painful groan as my body reboots. With a pounding inside my head that makes even my teeth ache, I slowly begin to blink open my eyes. Dim light soothes my vision as it blurs and focuses. All I can do is roll my gaze around. My body is heavy and sluggish. I can feel I'm on something solid and flat, but that's about all. Harsh white light pools from the far side of the unfamiliar room. It casts reflections on a selection of clean, white hospital machines, but as my vision clears, I can see they don't match the rest of the room. The dank walls are peeling, blooms of green mold making a patchwork across the gray. Cobwebs, dust, and ivy hang like some kind of eerie bunting from the ceiling. The cracked, dirt-caked windows are partly sealed off by planks of rotting wood, though I manage to just see that it's dark outside. Rain hammers on the metal corrugated roof above, but it's hard to distinguish that from the drumming of my headache. Looks like an abandoned warehouse. At least I was kind of on the right track with the Ferris warehouse. The thought gives less comfort than I'd hoped, and I'm beginning to wish all my senses weren't suddenly returning. The musty, damp smell invades my nose and makes me attempt a weak cough. I groan lightly again, trying to roll off whatever I'm on, but my arms don't budge, and neither do my ankles. Glancing down in a sudden panic, I find leather straps binding my limbs in place. The thick metal buckles pinch into my skin, the cold iron biting like ice. You're finally awake. The echoing voice brings a flood of memories storming into my mind. The smoke, the fight, the thralls, Murphy, Nate. With every bit of strength I can muster, I yank my wrists against the straps. Unsurprisingly, they don't budge. But I keep going, expelling a ragged breath with the attempt. Don't strain yourself, detective, Murphy says, his shoes squeaking against the floor as he walks around the medical table, which I now realize is what I'm on, and into my limited view. You'll still be recovering from the drug I gave you to keep you quiet. Exhaustion claws at my arms and legs, but I keep going anyway, struggling and pulling at the bonds. Panic streams throughout my system as well as whatever Murphy used on me, making the task feel like an impossible one. After a few minutes, while Murphy just watches with crossed arms, I finally collapse back on the table. My chest rises steeply with heavy breaths. Feel better? Murphy asks with a smirk. Now that's out of your system, we can get on to the real task. He approaches closer, the light catching his face, his clammy skin glistening with perspiration. He notices where my gaze has fallen and gives a heavy shrug. Excuse my appearance. Your blood drained from me a while ago, and it's left me a little shattered. He raises a hand to tug back his strands of lank, sweat-soaked hair, his fingers shaking. My blood? I ask catching the words after a moment. Oh yes, he says, grinning and leaning over me. Don't you understand? Your blood is quite incredible. I turn a forced smile on him. Then how about you take some and let me go, hmm? The suggestion makes him chuckle. If only it were so simple, detective. I'm guessing it's not, I ask, the false hope draining from me. He shakes his head. Not even a little bit. He makes to step away and I let my attention follow, my head rolling to one side. As I do, I spy a polished metal tray by the side of the bed, a selection of vicious looking medical tools, I can only imagine they're designed to inflict pain rather than heal, lay like a row of shark's teeth on its surface. Oh, don't worry about those, Murphy says with a smile. They're just for show, unless you misbehave, of course. Then they'll be most useful. He winks, sending a shudder rattling down my back that adds to the aches already there. How did you get my blood? I ask. Distracting him might help for a while, although I'm going to have to come up with a better plan at some point. Hopefully my head and body will stop pounding long enough to let me think clearly. Murphy shrugs, fiddling with a couple of the machines at the end of the room. Oh, remember when you cut yourself in my lab? He looks over his shoulder at me. Even after testing, it was more than enough to put my plan into motion today. What? He half turns to me and cocks his head. What did the agency actually find out about your blood? 
then the question is waved away by a flick of his hand. It doesn't matter. What I know will far exceed what they think they know. I stare at him, subtly testing the bonds. They still don't move. I stifle a sigh. Your blood is power, detective, Murphy exclaims, hands flinging into the air in excitement. Although that may make it impossible for me to use my pheromones, the power your blood provides was well worth the risk. What? I feel like I'm on repeat. Murphy settles down on a chair, the rotted wood groaning. Your blood is like a battery for us. A vampire who consumes your blood will have an extreme boost in their abilities. It will eventually be burnt through, though, like burning through an energy drink. So the effect is, unfortunately, only temporary. But the more blood is consumed, the longer the effect stays. The information pinches at my already bruised mind. That's how you manage to create thralls during the day. He nods. Yes. Well done, detective. So you're hoping to drain me? No, no. Don't be silly, he says. I wouldn't want to waste it. Keeping you alive is most important. A sharp smile cuts across his features. I want years of use out of you, detective. I swallow down the sudden churning in my stomach. But I didn't bring you here just to inform you of your unique situation. He stands from the chair, leaning over to start wheeling one of the machines closer. A selection of clear tubes protrudes from the side of it, the plastic, tentacle-like pieces dragging over the mud-caked floor. I've discovered something that can enhance your purpose even further. My eyes remain fixed on the machines, a dread settling like a heavy fog over my body. You see, when people with your blood type... He pauses, turning to face me with a chuckle. Well, I suppose that's just you now. He titters a laugh again, returning to poking buttons on the machine. When people with your mutation have vampire blood added into their system, the effects become... mind-blowing. He rolls a tall, standing metal pole beside the bed. It squeaks to a stop beneath a stream of harsh light. A bag of deep red blood swings from a hook at the top of it. Understanding hits me like a train. My gaze flashes from the blood to the machine, and then finally to Murphy. I swallow down my uncertainty and steady my voice. You know, I remember this not working out so well the other times you've tried it. Murphy's face contorts into an angry sneer. I don't need the reminder, detective. Well, considering you're going to try this on me, I really think you do. The sneer turns to a frown. The other times I've tried this may have been failures, but I finally understand what I was doing wrong. He returns his focus to the machines, stooping down to retrieve one of the plastic tubes. A needle juts out from the end of it. I was trying to replace all of their blood with vampire blood, which had the unfortunate side effect of killing them. He steps closer, needle grasped in his white-knuckled hand. But now I know I have to mix the two, human and vampire. Not replace it all completely. It won't change you at all. Don't worry about that. You'll still be boringly human. With a flashing gaze, he looks over me. And with your mutation, it should take this time. There's still time to stop this, Murphy, I say, the pleading making me frown. Why would I stop when I'm so close to getting everything I want? He asks with a scoff. I hiss in pain as he jabs the needle into my arm with violent force. He doesn't apologize, only sets about taping it in place. Afterwards, he walks to the other side, burying another needle into my other arm. The tubes jut out of my skin. It's almost like watching a nightmare rather than reality. I wonder if you'll be more compliant after this. He smiles and then flicks on the machine. It whirs to life, sputtering for a moment. It's a couple of seconds before the tubes begin to stain with a dark red. I watch in horrified panic as the blood spills from the bag and creeps closer to my arm through the plastic. As much as I try to struggle away, it crawls around the twists of tubing, ever closer towards me. It finally hits the needle. Pain erupts like acid searing through my veins. White-hot agony explodes around my body. My back arches. And I scream. At the agency facility. Nate leans against the wall of the corridor, hands shoved deep into his pockets to stop them from clenching. 
The others seem to be as uneasy as he is. Morgan puffs on her third cigarette in a row, sucking on it so deeply that the light burns down to almost reach her fingertips. Farah is seated on the edge of a chair, her feet tapping a fast rhythm on the ground as she fidgets. Even Adam looks lost, pacing the short width of the corridor, a hand running over his hair. They all flash their gazes to the green door as it finally opens. Rebecca steps out, clothes still torn and hair still knotted from the fight. She hasn't stopped working since finding out Celeste was taken. Well, Farah asks, jumping up from her chair. The thrall is awake and no longer under Murphy's control, she says, to which there is a collective, relieved sigh from the team. Agent Channa is on her way. We'll find Murphy soon enough. Morgan arches a thick brow. You're bringing Channa in on this? Nate purses his lips, wondering the same thing but he can see the desperation in Rebecca's brown eyes, fear tightening her expression. She will be able to pull the information from the Thrall's mind, Rebecca explains. It's in there somewhere, even if he doesn't know it now. Yeah, Farrah says, but the agency doesn't usually allow that kind of thing and people caught in the crossfire. We need to do this, Rebecca barks suddenly, making them all flinch. Nate steps towards her as she lets out a heavy, calming breath. It's all right, Rebecca. We understand. She stares up at Nate, eyes gleaming in the dull light. Then you understand what I'll do to make sure Celeste gets back safely. Nate frowns in uncertainty. He glances down as Rebecca pulls something out of her pocket and holds it out on her palm. Adam's eyes widen, and he takes a wide step up beside Nate. That's DMB. The pure form. You can't ask us to use this, Rebecca, Nate says. Murphy will get what he deserves without you risking using this. If they found out, I don't care about the rules, she says, voice calm but firm. I care about my daughter. Take this and use it if you need to. Nate glances at Adam, who hesitates before giving a nod. All right, Adam says, reaching out to take the syringe and shoving it quickly into his pocket. Nate bites back further protest, and, with a final nod, Rebecca disappears back into the interrogation room. Through the crack in the door, Nate can just see the thrall, now once again human, strapped to a chair, eyes flashing about the room in terrified confusion. The door shuts. Well, Farrah pouts for a moment. I've never seen her so, uh, willing to skirt the rules. In fact, I think this is the first. Nate sighs, but uncertainty still niggles at his mind. It is her daughter that she's trying to find. This is why emotional connections only hinder our progress, Adam states, folding his arms. Oh yeah, Farrah says. They're totally awful. She grins as Adam flashes a glare her way. Heels clack against the stone floor. Nate swings around to see Agent Channa striding down the hallway, her gleaming, dark chestnut hair tied into a messy knot. Her usual stylish clothing is replaced by jogging bottoms and a t-shirt. Guess Rebecca called her out of bed for this. It's probably near midnight. Nate hadn't even noticed the time pass. Chana steps into the light of the corridor, revealing the pointed tips to her ears. When she blinks, her large eyes flash a bright blue before settling to their usual bright hazel. Where is Agent DeWolf? Chana asks, a half yawn following the question. Adam gestures to the door. Right, Shanna says. Nate reaches out towards her, and she spins to face him. Thanks for doing this. She smiles. I'd do anything to help anyone in this agency. You know that. We all would. And with that, she opens the door and steps inside. I guess now we just wait, Ferris says, falling back into the chair and sighing. Adam tenses. I doubt it will be long. And then we can finally find Celeste, Nate mutters worry for the detective consuming him like a poison. Still in an unknown location, at the edge of town. Darkness. It's all that consumes me for a long while. I'm not sure how long, but it certainly feels like an eternity. Then light flutters at the edge of my senses. There's a noise, too. Something familiar. A sound that makes my skin crawl. 
detective? The voice asks. Come on, you have to be alive. My eyes peel open slowly, and I instantly squeeze them shut again as the dim light pierces into my head. Ow. Oh, the voice exclaims. Y you're alive. You're really alive. <laughs> A hand shoves back the matted hair from my sweat-lined face, the gesture almost as heavy as a slap. The excitement in the voice sends a ripple of pounding achiness through my head and body. There's a definite taste of metallic blood lining my tongue. Finally, I force my eyes open again and get a sickening sense of deja vu. The same dilapidated room greets me. Peeling walls, wood-blocked windows, moldy furniture, and Murphy. The machines and needles are gone, at least. It worked! Murphy cries, mouth contorted into the biggest grin I've ever seen. Can you believe it? With no energy to respond, I'm thankful when a sudden clatter echoes from outside the room and interrupts his very loud celebration. Murphy spins on his heel, glaring at the door, before returning his gaze to me. Excuse me, detective. I shall be but a minute. I want to make sure we are enjoying this moment alone. Don't, uh, go anywhere. And with a chuckle at his own joke, he heads out of the room, snapping the door shut behind him. Silence settles over the room, the lack of sound soothing to my pain-wracked body. I'm alone. My gaze flops to the door, not hearing footsteps. I probably won't get another chance like this if I want to escape, but even the idea makes me wretch at the thought of moving. My energy is currently running near empty. I flash my limited gaze around as much as possible. It's difficult to see as my vision blurs, pain racking at my body but I narrow my eyes, focusing my mind even harder on finding something to help with these bonds. After just a moment, my eyes land on a pen by my hand on the metal hospital bed. Murphy must have left it before he went. I smile, and then wince as my face aches with the expression. It's difficult to curl my fingers towards it with my wrist strapped down so tightly, but after a few attempts, and one heart-stopping moment when I almost pushed the pen off the bed, I grasp the pen tightly in my fist. After taking a moment to draw in a steadying breath, I set to work, wiggling the pen beneath the strap and between the buckle. My fingers twist into painfully awkward positions, but I force myself on. And then, it finally gives. The strap flips out of the metal buckle, and I yank my hand free, almost letting out a choked sob of relief. Not wasting any time, I set about undoing the other straps. When all my limbs are finally free, I slowly swing around, gritting my teeth as pain streaks through my body at the movement. Then I clamber from the table. As soon as my feet hit the floor, my knees buckle. I barely contain my yelp of pain as my kneecaps crash into the cracked tile ground. Exhaustion threatens to keep me pinned. But I push through, my breath short and labored. I force myself onto my feet. Using whatever furniture is nearby for support, I stumble towards the door. There's no sound from outside as I crack the door open, and I shuffle out. My legs almost give out once again, so I fall against the wall to keep myself upright. With pain continuing to feel like it's tearing at every muscle, I begin heading down the corridor at my hobbled pace. My hands rest on the soggy wall to guide me through the murky darkness. The corridors are almost impossible to navigate. A stray shaft of moonlight streaking through a hole in the metal ceiling is the only thing to guide my way. Cracked, fallen beams feel like hundred-foot hurdles as I try to stagger over them, only to end up slipping in the rust-colored puddles on the other side. Rain beats against the roof, and dribbles of it trickle down the walls. My hands are chill and slick as I run them along the wet surface to guide my way. I think my bare feet might be cut from the sharp debris lining the floor like a vicious rug but I'm in so much agony, I can't really tell. My breath fogs the air in front of me, making it even harder to see. I have to keep blinking my eyes rapidly just to stop them from closing altogether. My fingers are numb. My legs are throbbing. My mouth is dry and cracked. My skin is scratched and bruised. And my hope is crushed with every dragged step. After a few more paces, my body slides down the wall. I crumple onto the ground in a heap. The pain and fatigue are too much, almost paralyzing me as I try to catch my breath. I'm exhausted, alone, injured, 
and I still don't know what Murphy has really done to me. I could just sit here and let the cold darkness take me. It would be so much easier. No! I almost shouted in my head. I can't let those thoughts consume me. I can do this. I can do this. With a sudden, albeit tired, surge of optimism, I slapped my hands to the floor and began to force myself onto my feet. Gradually crawling upwards against the damp wall, I managed to stand, and with a deep breath to stem the aches, I press onwards, limping down the barely moon-brightened corridor. Drips of rain seeped down my back. A little clearer-headed, but a lot more exhausted, I round a corner into a large, empty factory room. Then I managed to almost stumble into someone coming around the other way. My heart pounds to a stop. Please, not Murphy. But the voice that says my name makes my entire body relax. Celeste, Adam asks, so softly I barely hear it. For a moment, I don't actually believe it, wondering if I've reached the point where I'm hallucinating. Yet I dare a look anyway, and my breath catches to find Adam standing directly in front of me. He stares at me for a long while, silent, unmoving, and then something unexpected softens the surprise on his features, something I hadn't expected to see. Relief. He's relieved I'm alive. He takes a sudden half-step towards me, hand reaching out. His fingers stroke against my jawline and then rest on my cheek a flurry of electricity sparking from the gentle touch. I thought you... Celeste! Nate's voice echoes about the wide open room as the rest of Unit Bravo make their way inside. Adam snaps his hand back and takes a step away, so quickly I almost fall forward. Nate doesn't seem to notice, marching towards me and cupping my face in his hands. You're all right. He sounds so happy it warms my numb body. Mostly, I say. His fingers brush over my dirt and blood-splotched cheeks, pushing back my slicked hair. He seems reluctant to let go, as though worried I might not be real. Deep brown eyes stare into mine with such intensity I almost forget everything that's happened, so lost in the caring, need-filled gaze he gives. Adam suddenly clears his throat, turning slightly away from us. Where's Murphy? I give a weary shrug. I don't know. I managed to escape, but I haven't seen him. You escaped, Morgan asks. Even in my bedraggled state, I note the impressed smirk on her face. We need to get you out of here before we deal with Murphy, Adam says sharply. Deal with me? The sudden voice booms around the open room. Just what exactly are you planning on doing with me? Murphy slides out from behind a cracked metal column on the far side. The gap that had formed between Adam and me is suddenly closed as he flashes to stand in front of me an arm out to keep me behind him. Nate glances over at the team leader's sudden and unexpected protective stance, but quickly shifts his focus to the real threat at the end of the room. This is all very touching, I'm sure, Murphy says with pursed lips. But that's my vessel you're pawing, even if my little lab rat seems to have managed to escape. He gives a scoff. Actually, you're not a lab rat anymore, are you, detective? No, you're truly a success. Each one of Unit Bravo's gazes turns on me, a range of emotions flickering on their faces. Confusion, curiosity, worry, anger. But seeing as you're such a success, I can't exactly have you getting away from me now, can I? Murphy takes a step forward. So I'll have to deal with your little herd here. I don't want them getting in the way of our future. You really want to take us on? Ferris scoffs. There's five of us! She glances at me, my body hunched, gasping at each breath. My hand is clasped to my bruised side. Well, four and a half, maybe. I'll take my chances, Murphy replies, his expression as serious as his tone. Beams creak under the strain of the silent tension between us all. The tension drowns the entire damp, dark factory. Murphy stares at the team. The team glare at Murphy. The tension finally cracks. Morgan speeds forward, once again just a blur of motion before my eyes. There's a heavy thump. I watch as Murphy is catapulted across the room, slamming into one of the metal beams. It buckles and bends under the impact. Morgan smirks, until Murphy staggers back onto his feet and brushes himself off. I guess we're beginning, 
Murphy says. He hurls himself towards Morgan, who barely has time to realize what's happening before Murphy is on her. The rest of Unit Bravo speed forward to join in. I didn't think I'd be much use in this fight considering my condition, but the speed and force being used makes me stumble back in shock. It's one thing knowing vampires are more advanced than humans, it's another thing witnessing it right before my eyes. One minute they blur into action, groans and thuds the only thing I can keep up with, and a moment later they pause to catch a breath, and then begin all over again. I press my body to straighten a little. My face twists from the aches storming through me at the motion. In my condition, I'm not sure what I can do, but I'm not sure just standing here is the best idea either. With Murphy distracted, I stumble over to an old piece of machinery, leaning against it to take some of the strain off my cramping legs. Speckled streams of moonlight are my only source of light as I begin trying to tend my wounds as much as possible. It's not exactly easy, and I'm having to work with scraps of already ripped clothing, but I at least manage to get something softer around the shredded soles of my bare feet. I also stem the bleeding from the wounds in my arms where Murphy had buried the needles. There's little relief from the pain, but it's a fraction comfier. My focus is drawn back to the fight as the punches and thumps suddenly silence. Murphy is stumbling back from Unit Bravo, heavy breaths puffing out of them all and backs arched like hackles on a pack of wolves. Murphy slowly holds up his hands, and a smile cracks through his bruised face. All right, all right, I get it. I can't beat you. Especially not all of you, like this. I stand from my place and shuffle a little closer to hear. The echoes of his words are almost lost beneath the continual pounding of the rain on the corrugated metal roof. Then surrender now and come to the agency peacefully, Nate calls, his words strained with obvious fatigue. Murphy's smile grows. Oh, but you don't understand. I said I can't beat you like this. The smile falls. It's lucky I have a backup plan. With a gasp, I stumble back. Murphy appears right in front of me, eyes glaring into mine. Time to test your worth, detective. He sneers, snapping a hand out towards me. In a sudden panic, I swing away from him as quickly as I can, but exhaustion and pain make the movement slow and barely balanced. Murphy simply flashes a step behind me, clamping a hand to the side of my face. I grip my teeth, trying to move, but his hand doesn't shift. This wasn't how I wanted this moment to go. He jerks my head to one side and plunges his teeth into my neck. Ah! My yell echoes and pounds inside my head. Unit Bravo halt their rush to my side at the sight. Whatever pain I was in before explodes through me. My lungs tighten and my breath suffocates in my throat. Deep red blood pools seeping over my shoulder from the bitten tears in my neck. Murphy laps up every drop. In a weak, instinctual move, I draw up my arm and snap my elbow back into his stomach. Amazingly, he stumbles away at the blow. I drop to my knees, clutching a hand to the searing wound on my neck. Blood seeps through my fingers. Unit Bravo suddenly closes in around me, and we all watch as Murphy gives a loud wretch, and then begins to laugh. His laughter echoes like a haunting melody around the shadowed room, and even Unit Bravo seemed to shift under the eerie weight of it. Murphy's body shakes. His grin is so wide it almost splits his face. Shall we try this again? He asks. Morgan frowns and doesn't even wait a moment before rushing towards him. Murphy simply holds out a palm, and Morgan crashes into it like a concrete barrier. She flies back, crashing into the wall twenty feet away with an impact so hard a crater forms where she smashed into it. Pieces of concrete crumble around her as she slumps to the ground. I stare wide-eyed as Morgan manages to crawl onto all fours, a line of blood pooling over her bottom lip. She takes a strangled, gasping breath. Holy crap, Farrah mutters. But Morgan clambers up again and heads for Murphy. This time, she's joined by the rest of the team. They're all pummeled back with ease, landing in a spread of heaped, moaning bodies. Murphy smiles again, raising his hands in front of his face and flexing his fingers. Oh, this is even better than I could have imagined. The team force themselves up and try again. And again. Then again. Each time, they suffer a new set of injuries. Soon they look as bloodied as I do. Murphy's laugh continues to add a tormenting soundtrack to the painfully one-sided fight. My mind is beginning to spin at the amount of blood oozing from my wound. 
When the vampires go down the next time, Farrah rolls onto her side and looks to Adam with a pained wince. We've got to do something, she says through a crackled voice. Just running and hoping to land a hit isn't exactly working. I stare at the defeated team and realize she's right. Murphy is stronger and faster, but there has to be a way to beat him. My mind pinches at the thought, blood loss making my breath light. My head feels like it's drifting to the ceiling, but I do my best to focus, clamping my fingers tighter around my neck. What exactly were you planning on doing to defeat him? I ask. Adam rolls his exhausted attention in my direction and hesitates. Then, he tugs something from the lower pocket of his combat trousers. A small syringe sits in his palm. I have no idea what's inside, but it's obviously our only option. All right, I reply with a nod. How are we going to slow down Murphy enough to get that into him? I hiss in pain as my wound pinches, and I glance down at the still constant stream of blood. My eyes widen, and I snap my gaze to Murphy. Of course, blood. Turning to Adam, I keep my voice low, but my words hurried. My blood is what is making Murphy stronger, but if he were to lose as much as I am, that would flood it out of his system and he would weaken. The idea sends a boost of motivation coursing through me, but not, apparently, so much for Adam. Are you mad? He asks in a harsh whisper. What do you think we've been trying to do? I have an idea. I frown. But you're going to have to trust me. It's a few long seconds before Adam's expression softens, and he nods. Keep him busy, I order, to which he nods again. And not a moment too soon, as Murphy once more barrels towards the team. Thankfully, he's ignoring me, as he has done throughout most of the fight. Flinging myself out of the way, I roll to one side and instantly begin foraging through the rusted equipment strewn about the ground. My hands clasp a long, broken piece of machinery, the end of it savagely twisted and jagged. It's perfect. Knowing Murphy's attention hasn't been on me at all during this encounter, it's the perfect cover for me to actually get close. Crouching in one of the deeper shadows, I stare across the factory and meet Adam's eye. And with a nod of understanding, Adam yells and throws his foot out at Murphy's chest. Murphy, obviously not expecting such a final attack from a staggering opponent, tumbles backwards. He falls. I move. Understanding widens Murphy's eyes as I lunge forwards, but it's too late. I drive the metal stake deep into Murphy's leg. His roar of pain is so loud it makes the building shudder, and I fall back at the strength of it. Murphy forces himself up, yanking the protruding metal from his leg. It doesn't begin to heal. Instead, it seeps blood, the deep red of it pooling around his foot. Not missing a beat, Adam sprints forward and drives the syringe into Murphy's neck. No! Murphy chokes, clawing at Adam's hands, but Adam doesn't budge. Weakness is beginning to temper Murphy's actions with every ounce of blood lost. Adam plunges the last drop of whatever is in the needle beneath Murphy's skin. Adam stumbles back, choking a cough and dropping his hands to his sides. I make to join him, eyes wide. I watch Murphy begin to convulse, crashing to his knees, his eyes rolling back into his head. My stomach churns at the sight of it. Until finally, Murphy lets out a long breath and falls silent. All I can hear are the team's labored breaths in the dark. It seems to take the longest minute of our lives for everyone to realize it's really over. We... we did it. The words exhale from me, my voice shuddering and broken. I stare over at Adam next to me, his eyes as wide as mine in relief-filled shock. We really did it. For one brief moment, I see only the light green of his eyes and the flicker of a smile on his pale pink lips. Shadow encroaches on my mind. I suddenly realize the warm flow from my wound is stemming, and not because I'm healing. I smile at Adam. Then I collapse to the ground.